Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Artie to Artie live show. My name is Megan Boitano, and today we have Dr. Melissa Brown on to talk about getting board certified in sports nutrition. And we're going to really dive into the certified specialist in sports dietetics otherwise known as the CSSD exam, um, really being the premier certification for registered dietitians. So we will focus primarily on that certification. Um, so if you have burning questions, I want to put out <laughs> there an open invitation to go ahead and, and drop those in. But I will be you know, clicking over and checking those questions routinely. So don't hesitate to you know, ask. And Melissa is really someone who over the last year, as she um, created a store on RD to RD with her uh, canine, it's what's her last name again? Gomez Hickson. I know Gomez she's got a Hickson. tough one. She does. <laughs> the hyphenation always throws me off. I'll get one bit off the other. They uh, have a store on RD to RD with a lot of prep materials for taking the exam. And I think it's one thing to take the exam. And then it's another thing to really put together tools and resources that help other people prepare. So I really thought Melissa would be an excellent person to come on and talk not just about here's what you need to know, but here's how to structure, you know, your your study process. And what do you really need? Maybe some insight into what's happening with the exam. What are some things that test takers are saying? So we're going to really have a good time time chatting. So Melissa, thank you for being on today. Hi, Megan. Thank you. This is my first Facebook Live ever. Well, we, ever. Um, it's, <laughs> you know, I actually really appreciate being people's first Facebook Live. And it's really fun for me to see people do them again in the future. Like, oh, that really wasn't, that wasn't so bad at all. And yeah, no, we were, I think it's going to be fun. It yeah. is. And as we were chatting before doing this Q&A with the two of us, for me, is always a lot easier than, you know, staring at a computer screen and talking. So of course, I definitely appreciate that, uh, that you're here with me. All right. So let's kind of go ahead and just Tell us about you, yourself, your career, and really how you got to where you are now, a little Cliff Notes version, I guess. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's a long winding road, but I am currently doctorally trained in nutrition and a registered and licensed dietitian and also board certified in sports dietetics. But it was a long road and a long path and a little bit odd, some might say, but I trained back in the mid-1990s in sports nutrition when it was somewhat of a really new field that not everybody really knew what it was yet. So I think I was very fortunate in that sense to have trained back in the mid-1990s. But sports nutrition is not my only specialty area. So oddly enough, I also specialize and still currently do specialize in pancreatic islet transplantation for the treatment of diabetes. So sometimes it takes a while for people to figure out, well, what do the two have in common? But for me, it really makes a lot of sense and it all comes down to metabolism. So both fields really have to get into the nitty gritty details of metabolism. And that's really what I love. So I continue to do both. And currently I am on faculty at the University of St. Joseph in West Hartford. And I'm director of the Graduate Options in Sports Nutrition. I created the Athlete Nutrition Advising Program and then also the elective rotation in sports nutrition for our dietetic interns, which really brings in a lot of interest for our DI because there's so few of those elective rotations out there. So that's where I am now. Wow. Um, I'm kind of curious what made you... Um, become passionate about sports dietetics. Um, and then we can talk about why you got, you know, why you chose a CSSD, but what was it? So I would have to say that even though I was an undergrad majoring in nutrition um, before my internship, I didn't apply it to what I was doing. I was an athlete. You know, I don't consider myself an athlete anymore, <laughs> but I was an athlete and I played sports and soccer was my prime sport. And then I started Taekwondo. And so I'm now currently a third degree black belt. But when I started Taekwondo, I realized that I was no longer just getting by on my gifted genetics and genetic ability for athletics. So 
I thought, well, why am I not applying my nutrition to my Taekwondo activity? So that's where the interest sparked. So it was a little bit later than others might uh, these days. So my first sports nutrition course was at my internship at Rush University. The very first sports nutrition course, there really weren't ones out there. It was by Julie Burns, who was the first sports dietitian for the Chicago Blackhawks. And I think she still is, actually. I, and then so that was glad it. I asked you that question, literally that you're uh, like black belt in Taekwondo. I think that's yes. a really cool thing. To I see. still use it now. I mean, I can't get through any training without actually fueling properly. So I still put it all into practice. I think what is the term you'll call yourself a retired, retired athlete. Yes. Just, retired athlete. <laughs> My, I now just help others. <laughs> if that's a fun story now. I know you're board certified. Um, yeah. So why, you know, how many, I guess, certification cycles have you had as, you know, a CSSD and maybe talk to us a little bit about why you chose it then? Why do you continue to recertify if you have, you know, maybe a little bit of background, you know, there? Sure. Yeah. So I, since I, I mentioned that I trained back in the mid-1990s, we didn't have board certification and, you know, until the 2000s. So I just just practiced in sports nutrition for decades, just on my, you know, having a doctorate degree in nutrition and, and just experiential training. Um, and I really never intended to get my CSSD, but my students want it and my students are interested in it and my trainees and my interns. And for me, the best way to help them was to go through through that process. So that's why I got the CSSD and, and I'll keep it and I'll continue to maintain it, but I had gone decades without it. And so I just want to, hopefully everyone understands that I'm making it clear that you do not have to have it to work in sports nutrition, but it can be of benefit. So you can go either way, whatever fits or works best for you. And we're going to talk a little bit more, you know, about some of those perceived benefits, but I actually think that's really interesting that you brought up, you know, that you, obviously you're an educator, right? You spend a lot mm -hmm. of time teaching and that yeah. really that mindset of how do I, you know, help prepare the students when I don't have firsthand knowledge really going out there exactly. and saying, you know, I'm going to go ahead and go through that process so that I can better support the students. I just, Love that. I think, um, you know, I such a soft spot for educators in general. And I think that's such a testament to, you know, people who are just really meant to be in that role. So kudos to you. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. I, I could train them in sports nutrition all day long, but until I had gone through the board certification process, I couldn't really help prepare them without being knowledgeable myself. So that's how it happened. And I want to make sure that I don't lose sight of questions as they come in. I'm using okay. the new uh, Facebook Live producer, and it has a neat dashboard view where I can watch things as they come in. And so this is kind of novel for me with this live stream. Okay. Typically, I'm trying to switch <laughs> over back and forth on my phone. So for all of you watching this, as although I've been doing these lives for almost three years, every time I log into Facebook to do a live, they've added some new thing or new feature. Oh. It's like playing okay. the game of whack-a-ball. So we'll have a question. <laughs> And Teresa wants to know if um, there, if the exam is kind of scored right away, is it kind of pass fail like the RD exam or is there a, a, you know, do you have to wait for your exam, your results? So the good news is that now, since I believe February, 2019, you get the results right away. So you, you finish the exam, you leave the center, and then you can um, download your results. And they tell you whether you passed or failed right then. Um, what, back in the day, when the early years, you waited weeks to find out. So it's much better now. And it just lets you know pass fail. You still have to wait to see whether, you know, which sections, which content areas you did better on. But at least you know right away if you passed or failed. Okay, that's actually really helpful to know. Yeah. Um, because I think it's when exams change a lot, sometimes when you're taking, you know, you're asking questions on various forums, you know, you might be getting advice from someone who hasn't taken it for a few years and the, in, the mm -hmm. information might not be relevant. So we're going to dive a little right. bit into like, you know, everything, ha there have been some changes from, you know, chatting with you um, that what's, what's happening right now from your perspective, obviously you're not 
you know, you don't write the exam, you don't administer no. the exam, <laughs> but you know, what's the word, you know, what's the current situation? So before we get there. Wait, since you, just let me mention, since you said I don't write the exam. So yes, if you have any complaints about the exam, go to, go to CDR. <laughs> I don't write any questions. <laughs> let them know. But mm. I think that was one of the, um, you know, reasons you know we're talking about doing this this show is that you can work in sports nutrition and not obviously have the board certification and yes. that you know in reality this exam covers a huge amount of content and i i think the question of is it too soon like how soon after you become a, a registered dietitian you know do you need to wait a decade or a year or two years do you think there's a how soon is too soon? And where do you think, is there a sweet spot, I guess? I never think it's too soon. As soon as you have an, even an inkling that you might be interested, I would go on the CDR website. It just work through all of the information so you're aware of what is needed. Um, but essentially, you, you have to be an RD. And you can't take it before you've been an RD for two years. So there's already that buffer zone in there. And I encourage everybody to get as much clinical nutrition experience during that time as you can, because you'll never take your clinical hat off. My students, my interns, I'm sure they're sick of me saying it, but I'm always telling them, leave that clinical hat on because you're never going to have a, an entire career where you have an athlete with no clinical diseases or conditions. So you've got that two-year time frame after you've become an RD, and then you can start logging your hours towards the CSSD exam. Um, but I say it's never too early. So even in an undergrad, if you're lucky enough to have access to somebody who'll give you some practical experience in the field, it's good to do that. I have a lot of students that come through undergrad, gung-ho, they're going to be a sports dietitian. They get into the elective rotation with me and then they realize, oh, this life isn't for me. So the sooner you figure that out, the better, because you don't want to go through the whole process, pay for the exam, get your first job and hate it. So I would just say, get your, you know, your feet wet as early as possible, a variety of different experiences. See if you really like it. And if you do, then start logging the hours as soon as you can. That's really, I think we'll talk a little bit more about this hours concept, but yeah. what are, you know, so you say the, the benefits of, if you can, you don't necessarily need to be board certified besides, right. though it counts for 75 CEUs. Yeah, um, I know. That's that a plus. Some of the benefits, I know I, this is my first cycle. I'm entering like my 20th year as a registered dietitian. And I took the CNSD, which became the C and a C right. exam yeah. three times. And so I've actually never logged anything thing I would only log the exam I know you're supposed to log all the things you do but you know whatever I just logged yep. my 75 for the exam so this is the first time I've ever had to um, log it is so convenient to just get them all like I know and done it's it yes people but beyond just the benefit of the continued education credits what are what do you see as you know the benefits of being board certified I would say immediate recognition of being an expert in sports nutrition because the CSSD is becoming very well known now. So if it's behind your name, there really isn't going to be the question of whether or not you've, you've had the experience and expertise in sports nutrition. Well, if you don't have it, it, it's not the end of the world. You still have plenty of opportunities, but you might have to prove yourself a little bit more. You'll have to meet with somebody and let them feel you out to know that you're actually an expert. Um, it opens job opportunities are at open stores if it's behind your name and some jobs now even require it so it's not across the board some will say CSSD required some will say preferred some won't mention it at all so there's just differences right now in, in how that credential is being used in terms of job openings or looking for new sports nutrition experts is there certain like sub areas where you know if you want to work with a collegiate sports team or you know, if you're in, in, you know, private practice, are there certain areas where you say that it's more beneficial than others? Right now, I wouldn't think so, other than maybe the professional leagues, only because it's, you know, everybody they're hiring in those professional leagues and professional sports are going to be the top tier. And so maybe they're not even going to look at somebody without a CSSD, but I still can't say that's 100% true. 
you know, there's going to be some in the professional leagues working as a sports dietitian without it. So I would say if it's going to be anybody, it would be in the professional sports. But across the board, I wouldn't say that there was any particular niche, really, that requires it. Um, all right. So I, I feel like there's oftentimes this, you know, as registered dietitians, we feel a sense of you know, a need for a certification or, well, I can't work in sports nutrition until, you know, I, I have to have this certification. And I guess that perspective from you who worked for, you know, a period of time, you know, these four, <laughs> yeah, let's just say a period of time as a seasoned yeah. professional myself, mm. I, I think I've, I've now say a period of time, we won't, we won't say how many years, um, that, you know, is there, do you think it helps people feel more, you know, confident or competent um, to work with athletes? Or do you really think it's that recognition and kind of leg up and not having to, I guess, prove yourself? Like people don't ask questions because they see those certifications. So they know you're, you know, an expert, you know, coming from the CNSC role, you know, working in the intensive care unit, like when new dietitians would come along and you were training them, they immediately respected you as a clinician because they knew you had advanced right. Right, right. expertise in a certain area. So I was like, can I say all of the above? Is that fair? Yeah. 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 But it really does have the benefit in the sense of just the process to become board certified. So logging the hours, making sure you're getting that hands-on practical experience and the studying and the preparing process, you know, you're just going to be gathering that knowledge and retaining it. So that in itself is a benefit. And I think it'll bring you to a point where you feel, as you said, more competent and confident and ready to go once you get those credentials. But again, not the end of the world if you don't pass that first time or you don't have it. But it definitely will give you more structure as to how you go about training to, to work in sports nutrition. Well, I think that's a really, you know, great segue. Talk a little <laughs> bit about, you know, we'll jump around a little bit, but the study process, you know, yes. for the exam, um, what does an effective study plan look like? Maybe we can start kind of larger and then maybe we can, you know, talk in some more specifics, but what does it look like to, to study for the exam? This can feel really overwhelming. It covers absolutely so much information. Yeah, no, it really does. And I just want to make a, a point and emphasize that it is an advanced practice area in sports nutrition. So it's not entry level information. Um, it's going to be completely different than studying for the RD exam. Uh, maybe we can get into that a little bit later, but that would be a good term comparison. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'll explain what I think is the difference. Um, but how we lay it out for people is, first of all, it's going to be individualized, whatever works best for you and where your training is. So how much training have you had is going to dictate how much preparation you need. But we lay it out with uh, a six week study plan. So if you start today, you would be taking the exam in six weeks and we break it down um, by chunks little chunks where each week you're going to cover a certain content area or a certain topic area. And we think that it's best to take the uh, most basic of the information, study it first, because that's what you need to then, it will be, you know, build on that in each of the subsequent content areas or modules. So we, we lay it out that way. So we give you an example of a study plan like that, but there's going to be a lot of people that need more than six weeks and you have to make that assessment yourself or less than six weeks. Um, and so, you know, we just want to make sure that you're not uh, gonna consider going in there cold, not having reviewed information and have some sort of study plan, but whether it's six weeks or 10 or four is up to you. When you say six week plan, are we talking about studying, you know, an hour a day or, you know, multiple hours? So what does that kind of entail? I mean, having taken some, think they have myself I'm curious what you hear from I know it's going to depend on the student but on average. right absolutely so it will be individual but whatever you can fit in so some people like to set aside maybe a couple hours every Saturday and that is their prep time or others like let me just dabble a little bit in prep for an hour a day like you said and get it in that way so 
depends on what you're doing. Some aren't working. They're just going to focus on taking the exam. Maybe they're in grad school so they can do that. But others are working a full-time job. And if you're working in sports nutrition, you know those are crazy hours. So you just have to be able to, to find a small amount of time dedicated, stick to it, and, and start knocking off the different content areas uh, before you have to go sit for the exam. Yeah, a good comment from Teresa saying she – uh, has the is scheduled to take the exam in May, May 14th. Yay! It's right around the corner. Uh, <laughs> she purchased the practice practice exam um, that you have available. So we'll oh ours. Oh, good. Thank mm-hmm. you, Teresa. Scored pretty well, and okay. but saw areas where she needed additional studying. So the flashcards. Mm-hmm. Any other ways you suggest kind of studying the specific areas where you need additional help? So a couple of questions I have here. One is taking a practice exam at the beginning, you know, we always know pre-test, post-test, registered dietitians, Mm -hmm. um, that is that a good, you know, that approach, okay, you take it and then you realize, you know, you have some gaps. Um, Maybe you can give Teresa some specific thoughts there. So, no, I absolutely agree with that strategy. So we do recommend that if you have our mock exam or another mock exam somewhere else or just some test questions, uh, we have some free pilot test questions. If you want to just take a stab at it, contact me. Um, Yeah, I recommend doing that because you see very clearly if you just sit down, take the mock exam and see how you do, you're going to be able to identify, oh, I didn't do very well in these questions. So you're going to put that on your list as I need to spend more time on this. But I, t- I recommend taking it again right before the actual exam. But in that, in that context, you would take the mock exam simulating the actual exam as much as possible. So you're going to sit in a quiet room. You're going to give yourself three hours max because that's all you're getting. And you're going to go through all the questions. And then see how you do within the time frame, because uh, if you're not aware of the CSSD exam yet, uh, one thing you should know and prepare for, it's heavily application based. It's not straight knowledge content, select A, B, C, or D. You're going to be doing calculations, running through case scenarios, you know, reading what's the best answer. So you have to actually sit down and take the mock exam, see if you could finish in three hours, because you don't want to leave anything unanswered. Mm -hmm. And I think... It can be challenging those types of questions because as a clinician, particularly if you're experienced, um, you know, that there's more information that you don't have. Right. And you're like, well, yes. I would want to know X or and it can really yes. eat up a ton of time or start to chip away at your confidence or, you know, make you start to feel like you're a little bit shaky. Right. Because yes. maybe, you know, it. it because you you would be more thorough in the information you would have in front of you, perhaps. No, absolutely. I'm glad you said that because a lot of the feedback I get from those that take the test, especially recently, is that the exam standardized tests are always best answer, right? But it's going to be best answer according to who wrote the question. <laughs> so you yourself, as Megan just said, might might be like, well, I need more information, but you still have to answer, you know, and, and put on your, okay, what would the standardized test question writers want me to put here. And that's unfortunate, but that's just the way standard Mm. exams are. But on this exam, you can enter feedback, which is one of the my most favorite things about the CSSD exam is you can put feedback in there about certain questions. If you think it was worded awkwardly or you think something was missing, you can give feedback to them. That's a that I think that real time feedback from the test takers, that's a really good sign of kind of a uh, I guess, a certification or a board exam that really wants to get feedback and get better. They do. Um, They do. And And a lot of them, just if in case you don't know, there's 125 scored questions, but then 25 questions that they're piloting and you won't know the difference. So you have to answer all 150, but they might be piloting some questions and get a lot of feedback about the wording of it and they'll change it or they won't use it. So, yeah, they're definitely looking for that feedback. Interesting. So as you're working mm-hmm. through a question, it could end up not being one that's scored. Exactly. Very interesting. Yes. Interesting. So just like any <laughs> standardized exam, not spending any, not letting one question eat up an excessive amount of you know time either. Yes. Okay. So. Um, Can I answer Teresa's question though? 
Teresa, if we didn't get in there with enough um, meat, you go ahead and let us know in the comments. Yes. And I want to go back to that comparison with the RD exam, mm -hmm. which we all, you know, <laughs> looking to take the C at SFD, yeah. you've taken that exam. Um, what, what would you say, you know, how does that compare? I Again, haven't taken that exam in such a long time. It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, from what we've spoken already, that it is, you know, heavily, you know, application based. And um, do you think that's a big difference? From I do. I do. And I also think uh, it, if I had to compare the two exams, think about the RD exam is right after a dietetic internship, which is accredited programs very standard content and, and competencies that everybody has to know and achieve. And it's pretty much the same training, no matter where you go. Now, of course, some are going to have different experiences, but let's just say for the most part, and it's only 1200 hours. So you're coming out of your dietetic internship, needing just 1200 hours through accreditation and the, all the dietetic interns are, internships are teaching the same information and then you take the exam. So I'm going to say that I think it's easier. It's by no means easy, <laughs> but it's easier to get the RD than the, an advanced practice credential like the CSSD because there's no accreditation for training programs. There's no dietetic internships that are just sports nutrition. It's really hard to get an elective rotation in sports nutrition. So the training backgrounds for the people going into the CSSD exam are so different that, you know, there's just too many variables, too many factors, and you need 2,000 hours to, to sit for the first time. So I think it's much more difficult. Right. And I think that, you know, application that you mentioned, um, you know, if you are working in a very specific area, you might not have yes. the same level of, you know, application in all aspects. And it's, you know, there's a very different um, experience of kind of regurgitating typical multiple choice test mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. and actually taking knowledge and applying it. And like you said, to what the test taker's best answer mm -hmm. is. And so right. um, that that can be um, a very different experience as a clinician. None of your your patients or clients are multiple choice questions. The last right. time I checked, <laughs> there aren't any. So, so you can be highly skilled highly competent, but yet yes. multiple choice questions are not, <laughs> they're not your client. <laughs> they're just not. Right. Um, and I think that that's something that you're not, you're not prepared. Like the CSSD exam isn't, you know, you can work in sports nutrition and provide amazing, you know, care mm -hmm. and, you know, support for your, you know, people that you're working with and yet maybe not dominate on multiple choice test questions so they, it doesn't necessarily define you either so i'm just throwing that absolutely <laughs> and we're, we're seeing that a lot actually we're seeing a decline in the pass rates for those recertifying which is really interesting to me and also co of concern but i don't think it's because our you know veteran sports rds are not competent we have phenomenal veteran sports RDs that might not be crushing the exam or passing when they recertify. And it's probably more related to that they're, they're specializing in one particular area. And so they're really good at what they do. They're very confident. And some might not be putting in a lot of prep time because of that. And I honestly don't blame them, you know, because they're just, you know, rock stars out in the sports nutrition field. But you have to remember that your specialty area might not be the bulk of the exam. So you still have to think about, okay, I need to prepare for all of the areas that are going to be covered. So I might be working with, you know, operators in the military, but what about collegiate athletics and professional athletics and eating disorders outside of the military environment? So all those different areas have to be brushed up on, at least for those that are recertifying. Right. That's really interesting that you mentioned about, you know, the pass rate, um, yeah. that, you know, that it is an advanced, you know, practice exam. And I wonder if there's even a, you know, a, a, you don't want everybody passing, right? Because it has to no. be rigorous. <laughs> but there's yeah. also that you don't want people, you know, you don't, <laughs> you don't want it to be an exam where it's not plausible to, to, to pass with relative, 
solid approach, that you have right. people who are experts. You, you also, there's a balance, I think. So really interesting as they continue to refine that exam. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about study tools. So you threw out a couple, we've talked about, uh, you know, mock questions. So, you know, I know in, you know, some of the resources you have are like a study guide, a mock exam, some flashcards, some videos, yeah. <laughs> like, pretty much you, you have it, have it all. So talk about maybe some of these study tools. And then you have obviously work with tons of students. How do you figure out like, maybe, of course, maybe you could buy anything and everything that's out there. But how do you assess your own skills and say, you know, what is best for me? Is there a way to go and say, what tools are available and maybe what ones would be a good fit or what are the most important ones? And then here are some others to have. Yeah, that's really hard. That's a hard question to answer uh, because number one. I love one, hard questions. I know. <laughs> number one, there's not a lot of materials out there. So there's a lot of standardized test prep courses for other things. There's plenty for the RD. Um, but when I did decide to to go through the process myself, there was nothing. And as my students started to, to go through it, my interns started to go through it, there was still nothing. And I kept waiting. And my uh, the co-owner with me of ProStyle Nutrition, Kanine, we were both like, all right, nobody's doing it. So we're going to just put all the materials we had put together and just make it formal. And so we did that. And we you know made the study guide and the mock exam and the flashcards. But Number one, what we did first was pilot test everything. So whatever is in the study guide now was pilot tested to make sure it was the right things to put in there. And the mock exam questions were pilot tested. We've got a pile of questions that we threw out because they were just terrible. You know, nobody that pilot tested it even knew really what we wanted in terms of what we were asking. So those questions didn't make it. Um, but it depends on what type of learner you are too. Are you a visual learner? Do you like audio? Do you like to hear? We had some requests early on after we created the study guide for the recorded lectures um, because people like to listen to it and hear it and they absorb it better. So we, we did those uh, based on requests. The flashcards also. People sometimes like to make their own because it helps them retain the information, but others like pre-made ones. So that was a request from customers or clients, um, and then some like a full course, you know, something that we don't have yet and, you know, we're considering for the future, but, you know, if you need a course where somebody's going to actually, you know, walk you through the material week by week, then mm. I would look for something like that as well. But number one, whatever you're looking for, um, whatever you decide to purchase, have it be from somebody who's been through the process, been in the field for a long time, pilot tests, offers you a, a free preview. Uh, I mean, that was so important to me. And I'm glad, you know, when I when I opened the store on Megan's RD to RD, that she's a big proponent of that as well. Okay. The materials aren't cheap. And I want you to have a, a good look at it first so that you can see if it's going to work for you before you even have to spend a dime. Um, what else can I say also? I also will never guarantee a passing score by using our materials. It's just not feasible. And anybody guaranteeing it, you should just be a little bit wary because as I mentioned, the background training in this field is too varied. There's too many factors. It's not like we pretty much know if you go through a dietetic internship, okay, this is what you need in prep materials and you'll pass. Maybe you can guarantee it in that area, but not with the CSSD. So okay. I'd stay away from any, you know, not stay away, but just be wary of anybody guaranteeing that you're going to pass. Yeah. Um, some good comments in here, Teresa. Um, appreciate uh, that, you know, you brought up some, you know, if you identified maybe something, Melissa, for you, that you're weak in a specific area, some of the video lectures, rather than having to get all of the video lectures, be able to buy like individual maybe subject area brush ups as kind of one mm. off so i always oh, yeah. think people provide the greatest insight i know oh, i love that that's such like a dumb moment oh yeah that <laughs> would make total sense okay a lot of our products come from that exact <laughs> reaction oh. like sure yeah we we should do that <laughs> yeah yeah no i have a yeah one of the really <laughs> successful things even on our need already was someone wanted a script for a, a 
uh, giving a presentation like do you have any slide decks that come with scripts and I was like oh. uh, yeah 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 and someone who had a ton of great workshops I'm like could you write scripts for these? And she did. And now they like always sell with the script. I'm like, how come I never thought of that? Like, yeah, no. And, and I love this idea that stop. Teresa just mentioned. So yeah. if anybody does have a particular yeah. content area, uh, just, just contact me. Yeah. I'll get you just that content area. You don't need to buy the whole thing. Yeah, so Although least- right now it's severely discounted because I'm working on getting rid of some of the background noise. So anybody who's heard those recorded lectures, uh, yeah, I'm still learning on that myself. So I'm yeah. I'm trying to get a little bit better with um, video making. Is that even the word? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that sounds like a, that's what it is. We'll call it that. <laughs> I'm sure there's a fancy term. There's a fancy term. So yeah. one of the things um, studying, you know, studying alone, accountability with um, groups, I think, um, do you have any best practices as far as kind of studying with somebody else? Is it important that that person be similar in background to you? I know I took a board exam. I had a study buddy. It was nice yeah. just to be accountable to someone like this is the content we're going through this week. And just to be able to text and say, did you do it? <laughs> you know? Um, no, I love this question. And, and if you're somebody who studies better solo, then just do that. But if you like having a study group or a study buddy, I recommend trying to find somebody that's been working in a little bit different area. So if you're mainly collegiate, so you're working in a college setting with athletes and sports nutrition, and you have some friends or colleagues that are in the pro sports or with operators in the military, I would tap into that and just kind of put your group together that way. Because if your weakness is in one of their areas, then you can all help each other. Good. Very and if you're one, if you don't have anybody, then I would just put a shout out on one of our two professional boards. So either CPSDA or SCAN and see if you can find some study buddies, especially now with all these new remote tools. You don't even have to be in the same city. Yeah. Isn't that great? I mean, there are some pros and cons to this last everything virtual. <laughs> yeah. So we talked a little bit about the benefits, and I know one of the comments was, you know, someone was required to have it working with, I think, hockey, you know, working in hockey players, but other, I guess, roles or positions where you just, you know, know that that CSSD is going to be kind of required. Any that we haven't, that you didn't mention already? I don't think so. I mean, it's really still just more of, I guess, a a preference rather than a necessity. Although you don't know what the future is going to hold. So if you're going to be in sports nutrition, you might as well just get it, you know, and because someday it might be required by all jobs. We don't know. We really don't know. It's becoming much more, you know, well-recognized, you know, people understand what the CSSD is now rather than us having to explain it um, and but we don't know what the future holds so right now across the board you still can get a job without it and if um, if you do start a job and they say you need to have it within one year for instance ask your employer if they'll pay for that exam you know will you pay for me to get the prep materials and take the exam all they can say is no right but you might as well see if they'll pay for it if it's a requirement for that job Absolutely. All right. I have two new comments here. Um, looking for your contact information. Um, we can add that in or I'll add that in comments, okay. however you'd yeah. like to be um, contacted. Um, but, you know, on a scale of really one to 10, we talked about preparing for the RD exam versus preparing. they are two different exams. How would you compare like studying for the you know advanced practice board certification exam versus you know people studying efforts to pass the rd exam so i really like those oh. number comparisons okay. how would it, let's see so on a scale of one to ten yeah i would say and geez anybody studying for the rd right exam right now might be like are you kidding me i would put the rd exam at maybe a four or five and here's why because <laughs> normally you're not doing anything else you just finished the dietetic internship and if you're in a good internship you'll have been going through prep for you know months before you finish you know i know at usj 
they're taking practice exams weekly. So we're getting them ready. Um, and mine way back, I went to Rush University. They really, really prepared us well. So the exam turned out to be pretty decent, not too bad. And the prep wasn't too bad. And I would write the CSSD because it's such a wide breadth of information, um, advanced practice area. I'm going seven or eight and for some even higher, I would think. Yeah. But you forced me to give numbers, but I, I wouldn't have. Done. <laughs> but I think that that's also, you know, a, a really, you know, it's one not to like scare people, but also to that whole respect for the content that's covered as well as the yeah. breadth, the depth and the application, which we mentioned, I think going mm -hmm. in, and expecting this to be an application in you know a multiple choice environment that's in and of itself really can yeah. change how you prepare for the exam they're not going to be asking you to regurgitate memorizable information they're going to expect you to have the base knowledge mm -hmm. and apply it in you know situations with the information that exactly you have to the test test question writers you know, yeah. what they might want on that question. And to also acknowledge, as you mentioned, some of those questions are just being <laughs> piloted too, which is right. and so very interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to comment there because I can imagine <clears throat> that would really throw me off if it were a question that hadn't yet been fully vetted. It would throw me off on my test taking. So for any of you <laughs> who've gone through that, major kudos to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we, you mentioned that it's not too soon, like if you know you want to specialize in sports dietetics, that it's not too soon to, you know, there's no magical hoop you need to jump through other than mm -hmm. to know that it does take, you know, a lot of time and prep and experience, obviously, in the hours. Can you talk, you mentioned the hours to sit for the exam. Do you have to have two years of experience before you can even start counting those hours or you can... How does no, that? you can count them, okay. um, but you can't sit for it until two years right. later. And any any questions like that, definitely go on the CDR website. Look at every little detail that they give you, um, just so that you're just very clear on what you're going to need to do and what counts as hours. And if you have any questions about a particular activity counting as an hour, email them. Ask, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I found CDR to be very, you know, typically very responsive over email in regards mm -hmm. to their yep. certifications or learning plans or pre-approval. Right. Continuing ed, usually they're pretty, pretty explicit too with their responses. So now, is there anything else, you know, we really haven't touched on yet on preparing for this exam um, that you think people should really know? Because um, sometimes I miss asking questions. About this exam, um, so right now, we're still using the 2017 content areas. So content area wise, it hasn't changed or it hasn't evolved. But the important thing to remember is within those content areas, you need to stay up to date because certain things like dietary supplements, maybe it was banned, a particular supplement was banned last year. And maybe it's no longer banned. And you have to keep up on that because the exam will change to reflect that. So while we're still using the same content areas, how they actually ask the questions and the particular topic within that content area will change. And about every six months or so, they could be doing new questions. So just keep that in mind. Um, can I just give some, some practical logistical tips? Yeah. Uh, learning the hard way. Uh, so... Once you know your test date, the closer you get to your test date, please drive to the testing center <laughs> to, to see where it is. You don't want to go there for the first time and get lost and, and not know where to park or not know where the restrooms are. And, and then you panic and you spend all your effort trying to find the location and then you're frazzled for the exam. So I've had that happen to some some students. So now we tell people all the time, go find the site ahead of time. You know exactly where you're going. Yeah, um, I couldn't find a test location. It was like in an airplane hangar and they were like working on airplanes because it was like aviation school. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> and I would never have found it. So I'm glad that was really good advice. Yeah. That could be hard to find. Could be. Uh, <laughs> as a sports dietitian, we always tell athletes, don't try, don't eat anything new on game day. <laughs> don't eat anything new the night before the day of. Um, stick to the familiars. 
And I would say, this is pretty embarrassing, but I would say bring two calculators. Okay, the reason for that is when I did go in to take it, I brought one and within five minutes it stopped working. So, you know, you have three hours to do the exam and I was doing uh, long division and calculations on a piece of, uh, is this a scratch paper or scrap paper? Either way, mm. that's how I had to take the exam one time. So bring two calculators. And two calculators. <laughs> something I will never forget. That's actually um, good advice. So there's so much we could talk about it in, yeah. I want to be cognizant of um, time, time, but that people, um, Kimberly had a question about, she applied to take the test a few years ago and actually, you know, didn't, do I need to, you know, apply again? And my thought is you would probably want to reach out to CDR. I'm sure that you probably do, but I'm not sure that you're best. So let me just make sure I'm understanding the question. All of the information went in with the application. She got the approval to sit for the exam. I'm guessing it says I applied, but didn't. So do okay. I need to apply? We'll uh, still need to apply. I would definitely reach out and see if you can avoid having to go through that whole application again, because it's a lot to put log in all those hours you took. See what they say. They might just say you're still approved um, and just pay the fee again. Maybe I'm sure they're going to collect more money. No, I'm not sure about that either. I would reach out to them. That's a that's a good question and one that actually I haven't been asked before. Oh, that's oh. correct. She said correct. So before we wrap up, I want to make sure people know um, how they can connect with you, mm -hmm. um, that you know you do have some amazing resources, study guide, the flashcards, you mentioned the videos. Um, how can people, um, I guess, connect with you and, and find out more about what you have? Well, there's actually quite a few different ways, whichever one works for you. But uh, we have ProStyleNutritionConsulting.com, so our website, and then you can email me there at info at ProStyleNutrition consulting.com. Uh, you can reach me through RD to RD. Uh, we've got the store there. So you quick message through there. Or you can email me at University of St. Joseph. So that's just mlbrown at usj.edu. I'll answer any of those. <laughs> so if you have a question, uh, first of all, let me just make, make it known that if you have a question while you're studying, you can contact me. I will try and answer and help you as much as possible. You don't have to buy any of our stuff. Um, I, I get questions all the time from people who didn't even, you know, purchase our study guides. I don't care. I'll try and help if I can. So oh, feel free to reach out. That's great. Um, I think that whole crowdsourcing of information and also to know the types of questions, is also really valuable um, yeah. to know what people are thinking and asking. Oh, Melissa, this was really interesting. Um, oh, good. I had fun. I think, uh, yeah, see, it was the live video, <laughs> yeah. what you thought it was going to be. Not so bad, I, right? You know, I, yeah, no, no. I didn't think it was going to be bad. I just hadn't done it before. So yeah, yeah and um, we, I do see your comment, Teresa. We will put um, some of those email in um, in the comments so that you can you'll see those. Okay. Um, and yeah, thank you for for being on today. And I um, will make sure to add some links to your store, your email, and there is Great. that free preview of the study guide linked in the oh, yeah. actual Good. post. Yeah, check that here. out. See if it'll work for you. But again, you, if you're preparing and you want to just reach out, you don't have to buy anything. Just go yeah. ahead, reach out. And I can't see any of you or names who are in here. So thank you for all that are attending. I appreciate it. And thank you to Megan for having yeah. me. And uh, good luck to all of you who are getting ready to take the exam. I know it's a, it's stressful. It's huge. And you know, um, and we've got this, uh, we've got, yeah. Uh, make and Hey, plan. if you don't pass, not the end of the world, you can take it again in eight weeks, best and, and most uh, financially best to pass the first time, but don't worry, you'll get it. You'll get right. it eventually. That's right. Good advice. All right, Melissa, thank you for being on today and um, thank you. A great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks. Bye everyone. Great. Bye-bye.